four. The Chicago Fair. Richard meets the Hyde brothers. The Hyde Exploring Expedition is formed. Bluff City, Utah, and plans for H.E.E. -E first trip. Grand Gulch. Richard discovers a new type of prehistoric Indians, and Talbert and Hyde names them basket makers. Snyder's Well, a massive burial in a painted kiva. Grand Gulch drains nearly all territory southwest of Elk Mountain, from Macomb Wash to the Clay Hills, about a thousand square miles of territory. This is the most torturous canyon, the whole of the southwest, making bends from 200 to 600 yards apart almost its entire length, or for 50 miles. And each bend means a cave or overhanging cliff. All of these, with an exposure to the sun, had been occupied by either cliff houses or as burial places. The canyon is 300 to 700 feet deep, and in many places, towards the lower end, the bends are cut through by nature, making natural bridges. Richard Rutherill, Field Notes. The Alamo Ranch hummed with activity in the spring and summer of 1893. Never before had there been so much work to be done, never before so many arrivals and departures. The days were crowded with promise and expectancy. Richard and his brothers had completed their explorations of Mesa Verde. They returned often, guiding parties of tourists, but their excavating in cliff houses was at an end. Now the visitors, arriving nearly every week, brought cheerful holiday spirit. Even the bright, blanketed youths found this mood contagious when they rode in small bands into the shady yard for a talk, or a smoke or powwow over a side of beef down under the cottonwoods by the river. Summer crops were in and doing well. Water flowed deep in the irrigation ditches. The cattle and horses grazed in tall grass and grew fat. Everything promised a good year. It was almost possible to forget the mortgage on the ranch, a specter which in leaner months was ever present in the minds of the brothers and old Benjamin Wetherill. Late that spring, Richard rode south toward San Juan, leading a pack horse through the settlements. By the middle of June, he was back again, with a pack horse loaded down under Navajo blankets, which he believed he could sell to eastern visitors. Benjamin Wetherill was delivering ice to ranchers throughout the valley. The ice had been cut in his reservoir during winter, bedded down in sawdust, and he was getting 60 cents a hundredweight for it. A good price. The Chicago Fair opened in May, an event of considerable interest to Richard and his brothers, since two of their Mesa Verde collections were being exhibited, and they were eager to learn the public's reaction. After stopping off for a few days at the fair for a few days with her nephew Herbert, Julia Cowing came to Mancos in the Alamo Ranch, arriving late in June. John Wetherill melt their carriage down the dusty road a mile or two, whooping and racing his horse toward them until Bert Cowing was sure there'd be a collision. Back at the ranch, Richard was waiting to add his greeting. Muldoon Kelly noted in the next issue of his paper, Ms. Cowing is an enthusiast regarding this portion of Colorado as a summer resort, as this is her third season here. The lady has traveled all over the world, but declines to spend the summer season at any place but Alamo Ranch, where she's always welcomed by the entire Wetherill family. A good friend of the family himself, Muldoon chose his words to allay gossip. Others came to Alamo Ranch, drawn by word of the cliff dwellings. A Mr. and Mrs. Wixon of Chicago had been so impressed by Mesa Verde collections at the fair and had wanted to see the prehistoric sites where the relics had been found, came in July. Charlie Mason, now living with Anna in the mountain town of Creed, arriving with Mr. Crump of London, who was doing the Wild West, and at the same time causing Mother Wetherill to throw her hands up and ask where she could put everybody, came Mr. and Mrs. Robert K. McNeely of Philadelphia in a confusion of baggage, four daughters and one son. A partial solution was found by moving young Win Wetherill and Bert Cowing with bedrows and bells of straw into the small barn, now used as a museum. This tide of visitors and sightseers also brought large numbers of people from Durango, now more interested in Mesa Verde than three years before. 
Benjamin Wetherill, remarking tartly that if this kept up, they would all be crowded into the trees, secretly enjoyed the company. Next to Julia Cowling, the visitor he liked to talk with most was Richard's friend, Charles B. Lang, a young photographer from Pittsburgh, who already had explored parts of this region, which even Richard had not seen, and who made the Wetherill Ranch his headquarters on several occasions. Lang was a quiet man with a bit of the wanderlust and burning ambition to photograph remote corners of the Southwest that motivated William Henry Jackson. Some time before 1890, Lang made his way into Utah's forbidding Grand Gulch with a companion named J.B. Nielsen and brought back photographs of cliff and cave dwellings similar to those of Mesa Verde. Possibly a few Mormons had been there in search of stray cattle, but as far as the record shows, Lang and Nielsen were the first white men to enter Grand Gulch. As a consequence of Lang's discovery, Charles McLeod and C.C. C. Graham of Durango explored Grand Gulch in the winter of 1890-1891, bringing out a large collection of cliff-dweller relics. The collection was exhibited in Durango, where it was bought by a retired minister from Kentucky, Reverend C.H. Green. So invigorating was the effect of his purchases that Mr. Green came out of retirement to pack into Graham Gulch himself, add a few relics and photographs to his collection, and then travel about giving lectures on the subject, which he illustrated with lantern slides. When the Colorado exhibit was being assembled for the Chicago Fair, Mr. Green arranged to have his Grand Gulch collection shown at the same time at the Chicago Art Institute. There it was bought by C.D. Hazard, of the H.J. Smith Exploring Company, who in turn sold it to agents for Phoebe Hearst collection that was later given to the University of Pennsylvania. Meanwhile, John Wetherill had accompanied McLeod and Graham on their second trip to the Grand Gulch in the fall of 1892. The stories Richard heard of these prehistoric ruins determined him to see Grand Gulch for himself, but Charles Lang was again in Mancos in the summer of 1893, and he and Richard went into business as photographers. With an eye to the tourists flocking to Mesa Verde, they inserted an advertisement into Mancos' time. Lang and Wetherill, Photographers, Mancos, Colorado. Cliff Dwellings Views, a specialty. Rocky Mountain Views, orders by mail promptly attended to. As he did so often, Muldoon Kelly misspelled Richard's name, Witherell. It was a regional tendency, never minded by anyone, and accounted for the popular acceptance of the spelling of Weber Canyon and Weber Mountain, both named for the pioneer Weber family. Toward the end of the summer, Richard was asked to go to Chicago in connection with the Wetherill's Mesa Verde collection. Part of his expenses would be paid by the state and require only to remain with the exhibit to answer questions. And I feel like New York City. Get me to the farm Get me to the farm Get me to the farm